In this week's In-Ear Insights, we're talking about personal brand. These days, with as many new social causes or existing social causes needing amplification, people and companies needing to be out there more than ever because digital advertising is getting harder and SEO is getting harder. We need other ways of reaching audiences. So we're going to talk about personal brand and how that plays into your marketing and everything else. So Katie, where do you want to start when it comes to personal brand? So I want to start with this idea that, you know, Chris, you talk about a little bit, and I want to respectfully kick it apart a little bit, because when we talk about personal brand, a lot of times what we're talking about is your ability to, you know, change careers, find a new job, that kind of a thing. And so when I've heard you speak about personal brand before, you talk about it in the sense of it's not who you know, it's who knows you. The reason I want to respectfully challenge that a bit is because I feel like that only works for certain people and certain industries. And so for the marketing industry, I can see where that works. The idea is that you're supposed to be out there and loud and known. But like, let's say you're a bookkeeper. You know, that doesn't necessarily translate into who knows you because you balance the best checkbook. Like it doesn't, it doesn't quite translate. The other side of that is, so let's just, you know, as an example, uh, a few years back, I spoke at an event and they had, there were so many people in the session that they had an encore of that event, of that talk that I did. And it was one of the events that drove the most downloads for us, you know, uh, from a session. And I got really ravey views. And so when I hear you say it's who knows you, that to me says, let the work speak for itself. Well, if I just sit back and let the work speak for itself, I do really great work. However, nobody cares because there are other people who are louder. There are other people who are not female. There are other people who people just, you know, the event coordinators just like better. So that's where I struggle with this idea of who knows you, because it basically translates into let the work speak for itself. And at no point in my career have I not had to advocate and fight for something, even though my work was top notch. So that's where I want to start today. I think it's a really great place to start because it, it separates two things. On one hand, you have reputation, which is 100% the work speaks for itself, right? You do great work. And people who have worked with you are like, yeah, Katie is a really, really great project manager. If you want to get shit done, Katie is the person to talk to, right? That's your reputation. Your reputation has to be sterling. If it's not, um, you're building on a rocky foundation, right? <clears throat> um, the personal brand side, to me, now this is my opinion, um, the personal brand side involves marketing yourself. To your, using your words, to advocating for yourself, mm -hmm. marketing yourself, because the way that we define brand, you know, the, the Zay Frank version is, you know, a brand is the emotional aftertaste of a series of experiences you have with something. Um, and a big part of brand, we talk about it all the time in our analytics, brand analysis, brand strategy, brand metrics, brand recall, brand strength is all about how much somebody remembers you. And mm -hmm. that memory is triggered by repeated contact, repeated experiences. The more experiences you have with something, the stronger that emotional attachment is, right? So you could have a pleasant emotional attachment to a dog, right? That's somebody else's dog. But then you have the repeated experiences with your own dog, which creates a much stronger emotional attachment because the dog's right there all the time, like literally right there <laughs> all the time. And so... To me, brand is not just reputation. You have to have the reputation first, but then you have to be promoting. Uh, and, as, and, and I can totally see your point where for some people who are not comfortable being self-promoters, that can be very challenging. Um, one of the easiest ways I generally tell people to start is with like an, e an email newsletter of some kind. And to your point, not every industry is perfectly suited for it, but mm -hmm. many industries are. So f let's use your bookkeeper example. Someone who's a really good bookkeeper could put together a newsletter, you know, a 52-week newsletter of just you know, one simple financial bookkeeping tip a week. They don't have to be talking about like, oh, it can be on the best bookkeeper in the world. They have to provide value, but more mm -hmm. important, have that frequency to say, remember who I am. Remember who I am. 
and so on and so forth. That's the creating that brand. And so it's, you know, when you talk about personal brand, I know that you always start with, you know, a newsletter is the easiest thing. I think for a lot of people, especially those of us who don't feel comfortable being self-promotional, that feels like a daunting ask because you're kind of trying to be self-promotional to people who have chosen to subscribe to your self-promotion. And that like it start for someone like me who's very uncomfortable with that it starts to sort of like make your head spin of like okay i have to provide value what if i don't provide value but isn't that you know what i'm supposed to be doing here they've signed up because they think i have something to say and it becomes this very overwhelming experience of people have chosen to sign up because they think i have something to say what if i have nothing to say you know, or, you know, what is a value that is still promoting myself. And so that I think that's sort of a bit of a conundrum that people can find people like me can find themselves in when they're trying to do that personal brand back to your point of the uncomfortableness of being self promotional. Let me turn that around on you. What oh, made <laughs> you want to start writing the opens, which is effectively one of the longest parts of the trust insights newsletter? Mm -hmm. Um, because there needed to be more than one voice of the company because there is more than one voice of the company. And I'll be quite honest, I'll, every week when I sit down to write it, I second, third, fourth guess myself of, does this provide any value? Is this any good? I hope so. And so it's more of like, okay, here's the newsletter opener, fingers crossed that it's something people care about or that people go, oh, okay. That's not a completely nitwit idea. But you still do it. I still do it, yes. Now, I do it, and here's here's the catch-22, if you will. I do it because it's for the good of the company. If I was not an owner of the company and financially invested in the company, I would probably find a way to talk myself out of doing it. Okay. So if the company needs more than one voice, why not have John write it? We could absolutely have John write it. Right, um, but I'm saying, why did you choose for you to write it? Because, I'm, because I've put myself in the position of being the CEO. And there's this unwritten rule that the CEO need, should have some sort of a vision and something to say. Um, you know, companies that appoint a CEO that has no vision, has no forward thinking, has no idea... They don't do well. And so it, yeah. I have to continually prove myself as CEO. I can't just call myself. I mean, I can. I can absolutely just call myself a CEO and live my life. But in order to be respected, in order to be, to your point, known, I have to demonstrate that I actually have a voice. And I can see where this is going. And I dislike you for it. <laughs> <laughs> your personal brand is important because you are the CEO of you, right? We are right. all the CEO of ourselves. We have that obligation to do exactly what you just said. <laughs> I have not had enough coffee for this, for this trickery on Monday morning. But no, what you're saying is 100% accurate, is 100% true. To be respected, you have to be present. You don't have to be loud. Like in, right. in, in all of the cold opens you've written for the Trust Insights newsletter, You've never once said overtly, hey, pay attention to me because I'm the CEO, right? right? You have said, here's something I think is a value. Here's something I think will help you do your job better or think about a problem differently. Mm -hmm. And that's what, if you want to build a personal brand and you don't want to feel like after you do it, you've had to shower, um, that's the approach to do it, is to say, mm -hmm. like, here's things that I think provide value. And in doing so, you demonstrate your expertise. You know, for example, the last few weeks, we've been talking about hiring. Mm -hmm. on the podcast and on the live stream we have a service to sell um but in order to sell it and convince people that we know what we're doing we have to provide that value up front to say like actually yes katie does know what she's talking about mm -hmm. when she's talking about hiring and so you do the same thing with your personal brand is you create that content to say well to demonstrate i know what i'm talking about in this thing like when i write my newsletter here's this thing um you, when we do data diaries in the trust insights mm -hmm. newsletter it's here's an example of how we're working with data so you can see it 
applied. You can see, oh, yeah, they they may say on their website they do analytics, but this is an actual demonstration of it. So it's it, it to going back to where we started almost, it's using the work to prove mm -hmm. that you know what you're doing, but promoting it in a way that that is, you know, show don't tell. And I think that that's one of mm. the difficult things when people start to wrap their head around where to start with personal brand is, you know, there's this feeling that if you're on social media trying to get noticed, you have to be loud and showy. And so it does go back to that idea of let the work speak for itself. But it sounds like, Chris, what you're saying is you can't just do the work and then hope people just show up to see it. You have to do the work and then find other ways to communicate about it. We go, so let's say we go back to that example of I was at an event. I did in the event's eyes a really great job. I sold out, you know, two sessions and, you know, then what? So when I show up the next year, they're like, oh, we don't have a speaking space for you. What in that example were the missteps that I, as the person responsible for my personal brand, likely took? The same thing that you actually tell me I do wrong with a lot of our stuff, which is we don't <laughs> we we don't atomize it and keep the momentum, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have those that talk that you did the the, the session. Um, why not take thirty second snippets of that session for the next year, slice up, and that's on social? Like, hey, this is you know, mm -hmm. what I spoke about and things. You put it in your newsletter. You put up a transcript. You write an ebook from it. Um, all these things to take that one piece of content, that anchor idea, and and expand on it and keep promoting it because it, to your point, it was really good. Um, if you look at what a lot of the, the excellent professional speakers in our space do, um, they have one talk, right? They give pretty much just one talk. <clears throat> they will give it, you know, a gajillion times. Um, but then that talk becomes a book, that book becomes a speaking tour and so on and so forth. So they're just taking their thing and, recycling it uh, a bunch of different ways. Now, there are downsides to doing that, one of which is that once you've seen it once, you don't need to see it again. Um, right. But to each audience, it's new. So in the case of the event, um, it would have been taking that talk, splitting up into pieces, maybe doing you know blog posts and podcasts and live streams about the things in that talk that you didn't have time to get to on stage. I, I made this point at minute 17 in this talk about, you know, how to build a data driven customer journey. We didn't have time to talk about stage. So let's spend the next 20 minutes of this podcast talking about this and, and so on and so forth. Um, guest speaking after you're talking like, hey, I just had a, two sold out sessions at Inbound. Let's, you know, have me on your podcast and we can see what about it made people so enthralled that they, you know, they had to come back a second time. Those would be the, the tactical things, because, again, it's that it's that heartbeat of presence. The, the thing that I, I, I liken it to is if you've ever been in a relationship, there's always habits, you know, saying goodnight to somebody every night or saying I love you before you hang up the phone or before you leave for the day. There's these habits that people have that keep presence of mind, that keep letting somebody know you care, right? Mm -hmm. We can take that concept and apply it to personal brand. How often are you letting people know, like the event, like the people who work at HubSpot, for example, know that, yeah, you're still around, you're still doing the thing, so that when speaking slots open for the next year, they're like, who's who, Katie who? They're like, oh, yeah, Katie, we got your newsletter last week about you know that point you made it inbound last year, and you know clearly people still like it. Hmm. Which is definitely so as the person responsible for your own personal brand, you have to make choices to put yourself out there. It might be uncomfortable, but it really depends on what your overall goals are for your career, for yourself, for, you know, professional development, those things. So, you know, in that scenario, the good news is I don't have lofty goals of being a professional speaker, you know, but I can say on the other side of that, I did find frustration to not feel like I got the respect from the same event the following year, following years, even after that. But there sounds like there was responsibility on both sides, responsibility for them to recognize the work, but responsibility for me to continually remind them of the work. And in that scenario, we both fell down. We both didn't do what we needed to do in order to make that happen again. 
Exactly. And the advantage of your side of it is even if they decided not to have you back, mm -hmm. the presence of mine might have encouraged other events to go, oh, wow, she's really she's really on to something here. Let's let's bring her to our event. And it might be a smaller event, might be a less well-known event. But again, it's one of those things where once somebody sees it, then you promote it and promote it and promote it. I was talking to my friend um, Donna Mostrom about this because she just spoke at an event in Vegas. She's like, now what? Exactly mm -hmm. this. Like, now you have to take this thing apart and expand on all those concepts that <clears throat> you don't have time to get it to on stage. But you could spend, and, and we have spent hours talking about them, right? When you go back and look at our podcast history, go to our YouTube channel at trustinsights.ai slash YouTube, you can see that we've spent, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 hours of talk time on a lot of topics. So there's always something that you can take apart and, and blow it out, you know? Um, and it's, there's even little things that you can do just to make sure that you're getting, you're, you're, you're reminding yourself to focus on stuff. So like, for example, each week when I do the Instagram snippet for the, for this podcast and stuff, on average, I think that's 75 or 80 percent of the time, I try to find a piece of you speaking because in terms of personal brand, I want you to get the recognition you deserve as CEO, as somebody who's led this company very successfully for four years, you know, made us, gotten us to seven figures of revenue and stuff. That's important. So even just something as simple as, okay, how do you, what percentage of, of you goes in the marketing mix for the company so that people can keep seeing that you are an authority on something? That's something that we have to do. Which, and so that... And thank you for that. Um, you know, it, as I was thinking about this uh, conversation that we are now having this morning prior to us having it, the other thing that I was thinking about was sometimes you're just not going to be able to reach people re regardless of how good you are. And it, because the, the thinking that I was, the root of thinking I was going down was when we talk about hiring, um, you know, there's a lot of bias that goes with it. You know, people, I was talking, I was talking with a friend of mine the other day about, you know, she works with a client who predominantly white men who only like to hire other white men who are very similar to them because that's what they're comfortable with. So regardless of how good, you know, this, you know, person over here might be, if they, don't look like them, if their names are not similar to theirs, if they don't have a similar educational background or similar, you know, journey in terms of, you know, their learning and career, they could be the best person for the job. The company still will not hire them because of their lack of diversity or their subconscious, you know, fears of anything that are different. And so I do want to address that point a little bit that, regardless of how good you are, regardless of how well-crafted and strategic you've put together your personal brand, you may still run into those roadblocks and they may not be anything that you're doing wrong. It's likely 100% the other person. It is. And that's where, <clears throat> again, as, as business owners and as people in the marketing community, I mean, you have to look at studies like what McKinsey Consulting put together. McKinsey did a, a diversity study three years ago in, in 2019 and found that something like companies which actually walked the talk on diversity had a 17% increase in profitability over companies that, that didn't. I think. So mm -hmm. from, you know, from the, the company side, if you have the opportunity to have that discussion with stakeholders, you can pull out that McKinsey study and say, yeah, we need to make sure we're diversifying, not to to be you know politically correct where but because it makes you more money um <laughs> that's one thing and the other thing that's important and I, and this is a, a flip side to what you just said is your brand is a filter right? your mm -hmm. brand is a filter sometimes that's bad because you know obviously there are people with biases but on the other hand sometimes it's a good thing because you may not necessarily want to work for a company that, for example, has a substantial bias against women or people of color or people who are not heterosexual and so on and so forth. And your mm -hmm. brand, if you're putting that out there and saying, this is who I am, will filter out some of those people. Um, they, they will not hire you. So yes, there is that diminished opportunity on one side, but on the other side, it's also you don't have to be surrounded by jerks. Um, mm -hmm. This weekend, I published an issue of my newsletter that was dedicated solely to you know, the Supreme Court ruling. I got a bunch of positive responses. And I got some really scathing negative responses. Like, I'm sorry I ever referred people to you. You're, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, cool. I'm, I'm happy with this. 
because you're not somebody who I would want to work with. Mm -hmm. But also it tells me you're not somebody who believes in data or the value of data because you would not necessarily have that strong a position if you did, which means that as a potential customer of mine, you wouldn't value the work that I would do because I would give you bad news in the form of here's some analytics to say you're you're doing terribly and, and you would be fact resistant, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So you, and you probably wouldn't pay your bills. So your personal brand can be a filter to say, yeah, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. This is, these are the things that I can do to help you. And if you're not comfortable getting hiring advice or management consulting advice or change management advice from a woman or a person of color, or whatever, let's not do business because it's not going to be good for either party. And I think that that's a really good sort of flip side to that perspective, because it is, it's that two sided coin. One, you can be really frustrated that you're not making headway and getting ahead. But the other side of it is that's probably okay because it's not people you want to do business with anyway. And so, you know, I think the point that we're coming to is, you know, you are constantly needing to work on your personal brand However, it doesn't need to be intense. It doesn't need to be, look at me, look at me, because not all of us are comfortable operating that way. A lot of people aren't comfortable operating that way. And when we try to, it comes across as disingenuous. I know when I try to do it, people are like, you okay? You, you, ha you having a moment? You, you about to jump off the cliff? Because um, it's just not who I am as a person. I've never been that way. Um, and so finding other ways uh, to demonstrate your expertise, to remind people, hey, I did this really cool thing without shoving it in their face. That's the real challenge. That's the real question that you need to answer is, how do you feel the most comfortable reminding people that you have something of value to say in a way that you are okay doing it repeatedly? Exactly. And I would add to that if you find yourself in a place where there are not enough opportunities and you, there's enough people who are like you, tell the establishment, go take a long walk off a short pier and, and do your own thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, for example, you're a, a, a member of the women in analytics group. Um, this is a, a group of people who traditionally have been very marginalized in, in analytics and data science. And so mm -hmm. a bunch of folks got together and said, well, you know, we're, we're tired of being told, no, we can't speak at this event. So we're going to have our own event. Um, mm -hmm. There is relatively little, I'm not going to say nothing, but there's relatively little standing in your way of organizing something these days, mm -hmm. particularly with virtual events, and things like that um, for like-minded people. So if you're finding that the opportunities are not there, find like-minded people and start building your own thing. And it, it doesn't have to be huge, right? You know, if you had a, a once a month Zoom call with 20 other folks, that would be a great starting point because every time you do, each person there has their own network and they can spread mm -hmm. the word and, each and that person has their own network. And eventually it can become a thing. Way back in 2006, when podcasting was was just getting started uh, you know, my friend chris broden and i were like we can't afford to go to all these podcasting conferences they were like 595 whatever so like okay let's do our own we got a room at bunker hill community college you know which if you've seen um oh gosh what's that robin williams matt damon movie oh uh goodwill hunting thank you um it was basically set the film there um it was not fancy at mm -hmm. all uh, the thing we spent the most money on was a, a vinyl banner. I think it was like 50 bucks uh, besides <laughs> renting the venue. <clears throat> um, and in the next six years, it became one of the largest podcasting conferences there was um, with you know, multiple cities and things like that. Start somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. Start somewhere with like-minded people. And find your community. Find your tribe. And that's who you need to be known by first. And once they know you, they can help spread the word for you. Yeah, I think that that's solid advice. And, you know, I think that personal brand looks different for everybody. And I think that that's the thing that it's okay to remember that, you know, and this is something Chris, you and I have talked about that when I was first getting started in this on this side of the industry, I, I come from academia, which is very different from the commercial side. A lot of what I learned was by mirroring Chris, what you were doing. And at some point, like that worked fine for a while, but then I had to diverge and I still am working on it, diverging off my, my own path. So it's good to find someone to emulate to start 
But then at some point you have to decide what does that look like for me? Um, you know, if I continue to try to emulate everything you're doing, Chris, then all I'm doing is really becoming a copycat of you. And I'm sort of losing my own identity in doing so. And so you've given me really great tools and examples and resources. I now for myself need to figure out what that looks like. Exactly. It's like cooking, right? Once we all know how to use the appliances, you got to cook what you want to cook. I may be like, yeah, I'm going to make a bunch of sushi. And you're like, mm, nope. <laughs> I'm like, great. I'm going to fry that shit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but it's true. Apple's brand is not the same as IBM's. IBM's right. brand is not the same as Tesla. Tesla's brand is not the same as you know Home Depot. They're all mm -hmm. different brands, but they all follow similar principles. So right. it's the it, we we have to do the same thing. Whatever your personal brand is, use the tools you know to the best way possible with the audience you have, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a key point. And then go from there. You may find Katie, for example, people may resonate with you best on TikTok. For example, uh, we don't know until, until you find out, but right that may be unique to your brand. So that's part of it. And I think that that is the other piece of advice is it's okay to try and fail. So if you, let's say you start a newsletter and nobody subscribes. Okay, try something different. It doesn't mean that your personal brand is not strong. It means that you haven't found the right way to reach the people that you care about where they are. Exactly right. Exactly right. And <clears throat> The only thing I can guarantee is there are people out there who want to hear what you say. There's mm -hmm. 7 billion people on this planet, right? If only one in a million people wanted to hear what you had to say, right? That's what, 7,000 people who want to be in your tribe. Right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there. It's just a question of finding them. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts on, on your personal brand, Katie? I mean, the biggest piece of advice that I can give people is be authentic. Don't try to be anyone else but yourself because it will come through and people will not, people will have a harder time trusting you because they'll be able to see through the fact that you are not just being yourself. Exactly. That's a lot more work too. I know. It's, <laughs> it's not worth it. If you've got comments or questions or you want to talk about your personal brand, pop on over to our free Slack group. Go to trustinsights.ai slash uh, analytics for marketers, where you and over 2,500 other folks are asking and answering each other's questions every day. And wherever it is you watch or listen to the show, go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast. We can find it on the platform of your choice. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you soon.